Um, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the nice introduction. So, actually, I'm going to single-handedly present some of the joint work we did, but also work Jesse Prince did over the last years on moral and aesthetic identities. So there's a long tradition of moral identities he has been working on, but today our focus is going to be more on aesthetic um, identities. Um, before I start the talk, I not just want to thank Jesse Prince for providing lots of the slides you're going to see, but also Javier gomez Lavin, who has been our collaborator at the uh, City University in New York, and he um, was helping a lot with the studies you're going to see. So he's going to come up a lot in the studies uh, during my talk. So the question we want to focus on is the question, what makes me me? What makes you you? So what is kind of the defining elements of your identity? And if you go into philosophy, some of the popular answers you would find is, for example, Parfit's answer that what makes you you is kind of you have access to your uh, history, you have a memory of yourself. So you have this connectedness to your background. Uh, another theory by Maria uh, Schechtmann is you have a specific narrative about yourself as well. So kind of you, you tell a story that makes you you, and how this story is kind of developed, that's the defining element of who you are. Another viewpoint, um, this is kind of Christine Korsgaard, they're just examples for certain theories you would find in the philosophical literature. She's a Kant scholar. And she has this idea that kind of yourself is constituted by the processes you have access to, so cognitive control over certain access, uh, um, states you have. Um, if you look into those theories kind of from a perspective also from social sciences, you might have some concerns and from embodiment as well. So kind of if you look into those th three theories, they all are based on kind of rational concepts of the self. So you have access to the memory to the narrative, or you have control over your <coughs> mental states. And we thought it might be more necessary in order to, to understand what implements and kind of constitutes yourself to go into more embodied processes. Another problem is that they are all utterly individualistic. So it's always one person who kind of access her own narrative and memory or has agency over her state. Uh, a third element that we find lacking in those theories is kind of there's something about public recognition. So the view from outside on yourself that co-constitutes who you are. And this is also to some extent lacking in those theories. And just to add a, um, a final point that might be lacking in those theories is kind of there is no recognition of what we could call personality. So the traits that make you yourself. You might have a certain personality trait, kind of you might be getting angry very fast, or you might be <laughs> boring, that might be also a trait, bless you. Uh, those things are not acknowledged in those theories. And we think that's kind of are all important elements that should be acknowledged in a theory that kind of deals with personal identity. Um, just to also quickly summarize, kind of, if you come from philosophy, if you deal with identity, it's mostly the personal identity you deal with, kind of what makes you yourself. There's this long tradition, at least going back to John Locke, that you can identify certain traits of yourself that make you the person you are. So the question you would ask from philosophy is what, and that's a question kind of we thought of kind of might be interesting from philosophy, what changes would make me a new person? So which of those traits can change and I'm still the same person? Which of those traits um, have to remain the same in order that I stay the same person? Just quickly, this is quite different from how um, psychology would deal with the question. So there, the, the question is kind of rather addressed from the groups you, you share or kind of the groups you're part of. So there's this idea of social identity. And there's this kind of whole discussion, debate going back at least to Henry Taifel on kind of in-group, out-group um, phenomena and social identity theory. And the question there is how does group membership affect our behavior? Um, and then you have this kind of idea, you have to understand the group you belong to in order to understand who you are. And that's more directly related to what kind of here might be the idea of bubbles. And one of the thoughts we had kind of getting into, into the topic is kind of combining those two ways of thinking about um, identity. So going to our research, we started with this kind of question, kind of I identified already in Locke, kind of, um, so how can we test what traits are important to identity? And the idea was kind of to just ask, would you do, be the same person if you lost that trait? And that's going to be a series of experiments I'm going to go through in a second, where we just did this as a thought experiment. 
According to the leading theories, if you go back to the slides, what are popular answers in philosophy, memory would be something very important. So if you don't have access to your own memory, you shouldn't perceive yourself as being the same person. Um, and we came up with this other hypothesis. We hypothesized that values should matter even more. And this is based on the idea that values, aesthetic or moral values, are based in our emotions. And if something there is changing, that might have a bigger impact even on the self. Just to quickly motivate that, um, that makes, I think, completely sense if you think of activism. So if you kind of have certain values you kind of dearly hold and you want to defend them towards others, kind of then values make up a lot of your identity. So if you're a political activist. Um, but you also can consider kind of other cases. It's just a, a toy. Yeah, Victoria recognized her. <laughs> That's Patricia Hurst. If you don't know her, she's the, she was, she is. She's still alive, I think, yeah. She is the heir and daughter of uh, William Randolph Hearst, who was this kind of big um, media mogul in the US. And if you don't know him, you might know Citizen Kane, which is based on him as a person. And she, when she was 17, I think, she was abducted and kind of taken in by a terrorist group and kind of indoctrinated. Then she committed crimes with this group. So she changed her behavior to before and became kind of the left-wing terrorist. That's kind of a photo. So actually, there was a bank robbery. And I think she just has been kind of pardoned by Bill Clinton some years ago. So she was in jail for that. But one way to think about this example is to think kind of um, uh, what she was before she was abducted and what she was after is kind of some, it's a different person. So there's something that happened like a moral, moral death even in, in kind of in her story. So she changed to be from this one person kind of um, conforming to society to being this completely radical person. The story is much more complicated, so she actually had some contact with the terrorist group even before she was abducted, and there's a lot of controversy about her, but I'm not gonna go into that. It's just a toy example to think kind of um, change of value might be perceived as a change of identity. And actually her lawyers in the, in the process that was held against her actually used that as kind of a, um, um, as a legal defense strategy, saying she wasn't the same person when she was committing those crimes. Um, so, the studies Jesse Prince did, kind of basic, based on those basic ideas with respect to morality, is kind of they gave vignettes to people. So they told them a little story they had to consider, and one vignette was kind of imagine you walk down this steep hill, kind of uh, through the mountains. You're supposed to fall. Yes, you fall on your head. Um, you, lo you lose your memory. Uh, you know, you lose your consciousness. You're in a coma for certain years, and you lose certain traits to this during this time. And what they asked for for example, was kind of, imagine kind of after the coma, you wake up, you don't have access to your uh, own memory. That was one condition. Another condition, they told them, imagine before you condemned um, petty theft or you condemned um, abortion and other things, and now you don't condemn it anymore. So there was a moral change as well. And they compared how much that was perceived as a change to identity. So how much are you the same person after this accident? And kind of you're either kind of very much the same person or very much not the same person. And what they found is that kind of memory doesn't have a big impact. So losing your memory, losing access to your memory, is not perceived as a change to identity. So you stay the same person. That's why it's a high. When the morals change, it's perceived as a big change to identity. And this is a study that has been replicated over and over again. So the question is, how much are you the same person after the fall? So if your memory has changed, you're still very much the same person. If your morals have changed, you're not the same person anymore. Is that clear? That's quite important. A lot of the paradigms I'm going to go through are based on that. Um, That might be a bit confusing now. That's a replication of this study where they actually ask, kind of, imagine that you use your eyesight. That's a study where you don't fall in your head, you take a pill, and magically your eyesight goes away. Or your desires change. You have a different sexual orientation. Or you lose your memories, or you lose your morals. And here it's kind of the opposite angle. So kind of um, um, how much um, do you change? And that's kind of the change for the perceptual, so losing eyesight, the change for the change in desires, and the change for memory is basically the same. The change for morals here, again, is a much higher change. Um, I want you to remember the desire part, because I think 
there's something weird going on because I would have expected and predicted that desires should change yourself as well because they're based on emotions and that's basically where we enter with our moral self and aesthetic self studies. Um, just one quick objection, you could say um, it's just a metaphor, it's just a metaphor how we talk about identity, directly asking those people that might not be the right paradigm to deal with that. So in a, in a quite clever study, Javier and Jesse asked people whether they perceive the change to the identity as rather being metaphorical or be a true change to identity. And what they found that for memory, it's rather perceived as being a metaphorical change, that's the right bar. But for morals, it's perceived as kind of a, a true change to identity. Okay, that's the background. Now we come to some of the studies I was involved in. So one idea was to kind of go more realistic. So not, not tell those stories about falling on your head, taking pills and have those weird back, back stories, but rather ask people kind of what how would you perceive yourself to be when you change from kind of supporting Trump to supporting Clinton? What would that be as a change? We did that in Germany, we did it in the US, and kind of so there's this idea of kind of binding morals more to uh, political elements. And here again, that's a study um, where those stories are told, just no coma, but just a change in those values or change um, in those everyday situations. So again, that's our um, anchor, so the lower, the less you are the same. Yeah? So you see for politics, the change is the biggest. For uh, occupation, for neighborhood, you change for nationality, for food, it's not such a big change. So that's basically the idea of kind of a moral self, a moral identity that can be um, read off um, those charts. Um, so that's the midline. In one of the studies we did here in Berlin, we wondered whether uh, changing your country and ad adopting the customs of other country would kind of change your identity. So we did a study, we called it a migration study, and we um, had two conditions. In one condition, people move to a different country, so George, that's me, moves to the United Arab, Arabic, Arab Emirates, um, adopts to the customs, but doesn't adopt to the, to the values. That's the right thing. The other story was kind of Yusef comes to Germany, adopts the, 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 the customs but not the values. And you see on the right, if just the customs, just the behavior, so to say, is, is changed, it's not perceived as a change to identity. On the left side, you see if you actually take on morals of the country you go to or you come from, it's perceived as a big change to identity. So the whole idea here was kind of to come up with more real-worldly and kind of more realistic scenarios to think about this idea of identity. And that was kind of one way to deal with it. Um, if you think about art, now moving a bit away from the moral thing, there's also a lot of very simple ways to think kind of how art might kind of define you as a person. You might be thinking of yourself as an art person or you might be artsy. There might be also kind of the distinction between being a craft person and being an arts person. You can be a film enthusiast and find that kind of defining for you. You might be a fashionista and you might really deal about those topics. Um, but there's kind of this whole idea of culture and art having an influence on kind of um, who you are. So you might express your cultural identity through style and taste. And that's kind of the, the background for today's talk, kind of this idea of aesthetic self. Before I come to that, also there's this idea, and it came up in Andrea's talk, between differences, cross-cultural differences there might be with respect to, to, to taste. And that's um, a small digression, which I find nonetheless very interesting about cultural differences between um, Japan, in our case, because we did a study in Tokyo, and Berlin. And we had this kind of idea that there might be other cultural traditions that might be held dear by people who come from, um, from those different traditions. So if you go to Japan, there are two um, very different um, visual features you can encounter. There's this kind of idea of emptiness you find in a lot of Zen art in Japan and also in Zen gardens. But there's also this kind of overabundance of kind of elements which you would find here in Takeshita Street in kind of Tokyo where you have a lot of kind of people dressed in kind of schoolgirls and kind of in very weird costumes. And it's, it's, it, it doesn't give it um, justice in this photo, but you understand the concept. So we were interested if you find a difference um, in artworks, with respect to artworks um, in those two cultures. So what we did, we manipulated images. So we took, in this case, we took the left image and added objects to the image towards the right. 
We did that for Japanese paintings, but we also did that for European paintings. So here, also the left one is the original, and we added certain elements. So this is the, it's a Kotan, 17th century, and kind of we took other elements of still lifes from Kotan and put them into the image. That's kind of the, but we also took, so here the right image is the original, so it's a very, it's um, Perugino, and he, would, he was one who actually, one of the few artists at the time who started adding many people to the, to the artwork. So he was criticized by Vasari even for doing that. Um, so we found this image on the right, this is very crowded and reduced uh, the complexity um, in this image by reducing the amount of objects you would find in the artwork. Uh, that's the same thing. So what we did, um, we showed those images individually and asked them how complex they find the images. And we thought kind of we would manipulate from low to high complexity by those images. And quite luckily, that's actually what we found. So we asked for the uh, uh, subjective complexity of images in both countries. We got very similar results. So actually, more objects make them more complex. Can you see? We also asked for preference. So we, we showed those three images at the same time and asked them, which one do you prefer? And also here you can see, so the, the bold uh, bars is Tokyo, the uh, empty ones are the Berlin sample. That's actually for preference, you don't find any difference. So if they see those three images, they have to pick one. Somehow they seem to prefer the most complex one. Um, but we didn't only manipulate the amount of objects, we also manipulated in um, two other things. We manipulated the amount of empty space in those objects. So we took actually the originals here in the middle, we made the um, space not filled by objects bigger and smaller. And we manipulated the amount of texture in images. But it's also an important kind of um, um, art historical um, measure, kind of look how much texture is used in those images. And here we, okay, the order is a bit off, so below is kind of more texture and it gets kind of less texture. And so we had those kind of three, three conditions. We manipulated objects, we manipulated space and texture, and we manipulated from low to medium to high complexity. And what is interesting here now we see for Germany, the higher complex the, the artwork was rated, the more it was perceived as a good work of art. So here we didn't ask for preference, we just asked would you recommend it to, to an art museum? Because we were interested in different art concepts you would find in the West versus the East. So here you see the higher the complex the image, the more it was recommended, which is a very um, nice correlation we found here. And that's kind of for the left side for object and space manipulation, and the right side for texture. I separated that because in Japan, you find a very different pattern. So when the texture is getting more complex, we find also a, a higher recommendation for those artworks. When, the, when there are more objects in there or less empty space, it's not perceived as the better artwork. So for this condition where we're talking about empty space, there seems to be something valued in the Japanese uh, tradition um, that we didn't capture here in, in, in Europe. Um, we also looked into kind of eye tracking. We, we didn't have a well enough eye tracker to do proper eye tracking, so we're going to redo that. But we're interested in kind of this positive value of empty space. Um, and there are kind of other traditions, kind of the, one of the traditions you find in Japanese culture is the idea of wabi-sabi. So there's this idea that you have decay and beauty coming together. So you, you would have kind of flower arrangements where you have leaves almost falling off and also kind of the flower arrangement capturing empty space. And if, if you ask people on the street in Tokyo, they know of the concept if they're young, but they don't know what the concept actually is. And our question now is kind of whether it still persists as kind of a, a, an aesthetic value in their country. So we're manipulating images like the left and make it kind of a bit more full to make it less empty space. Another concept kind of with Wabi Sabi is kind of you, you like the decay and beauty together, so you have those pottery and kind of we compare European and kind of um, Japanese um, aesthetic ratings of those objects. So that was a small digression to kind of a cultural difference. It's kind of how might that actually relate to identity? So kind of what about aesthetics and identity? So aesthetics seem to be beauty ratings, aesthetic ratings seem to be another kind of value beside the moral value. It seems to be related to emotions. You could argue that kind of a beauty experience is kind of an emotional embodied experience. So the question is, do aesthetic values contribute to identity too? And one of the first studies we did there was kind of focusing on music. So music is a very emotionally based kind of uh, 
art form. So we expected here to find um, results more easily than in other art forms. So we started with this idea. Also in music, you have these different ideas of musical identities. You can be into music. You, if you kind of like classical music, you also kind of might signal something like social class. So there might be a social element coming in here. And there are a lot of uh, musical subcultures that might be interesting that we might look into. So this is then the, what, we, what we did here. So kind of, you know this graph already. So we asked in Germany, um, imagine that you change from being not religious to being religious. How much are you the same person? And you're not perceived as being the same person anymore. So that's the first graph. We did the same for politics. Uh, which is a bit complicated in comparison to the US because we have a multi-party system here, party system. In the US, you have two parties. So, but in Germany, when you ask somebody from, you move from being rather left-wing to being more conservative, or you move from SPD, which is kind of one of the big parties, to CDU, it's not perceived as a big change to identity. Um, what we then ask, oops, that's not good, okay. We ask people, imagine your musical taste changes from liking pop music to liking classical music. How much are you the same person? And it's perceived as a change to, to their identity. So change in musical taste is perceived as a change to your identity in those cases. And significantly so compared to politics, but also to a lot of other changes like neighborhood, profession. Um, there is something that was in between that was kind of pastime. So imagine you didn't care about hiking before. Now you want to go hiking all the time. It's also somewhat perceived as being a change, but not in the same way as music and religion in Germany. Um, so, starting from that, we thought kind of what might, might drive this effect, and we kind of looked into how people perceive genres. And we did a, we just asked people, how close do you think jazz is to pop, pop is to classic, in order to find out whether something in this, 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 this map of genres kind of might influence this effect. So it might be the direction. So kind of we asked them just how similar, that's kind of a multi-dimensional scalar model here, where basically all we put into this is kind of measures of closeness of genres. And you see pop is very much in the middle, classic is a bit out there, electro is up here, and punk, so it makes intuitive sense, but kind of it doesn't tell you what actually the differences are. So we look whether kind of the move from the middle to the outer, from the outer to the inner, kind of changing the over the x-axis and over the y-axis, whether that makes a change. And we predicted that at least distance on the map should matter. So what we did, kind of, we did a lot of those changes. So we changed from classical to pop, from punk to pop, and different things. And we didn't find a significant difference between all those uh, changes that have the same distance on our um, uh, genre map. We found a significant distance to kind of a more close related um, um, genre between country and folk. So distance in this map seems to matter. Um, remember we had this pastime thing, going hiking, never having been hiking before, and then moving to wanting to hike all the time. Another example was video gaming. So you never played video games, now you want to play them all, all the time. Um, it was quite a different condition compared to the music condition. Music, you already like one music, then you move to the next. So I thought it would be interesting to look also into if you don't care about a certain art form and now start caring about it. That's what we call the anesthetic effect or the anesthetic self. So from not caring about an aesthetic thing to caring about it. So we did that with music again. So we told people, so you didn't care about music, now you want to listen to music all, um, all the time. Or you didn't care about music, now you want to play music all the time. Um, we even had a much stronger condition where we said, kind of, you didn't care about music, now you want to dedicate your life to music. And for sure, we somehow predicted that the change to identity should be bigger for dedicating your life compared to listening to music. Um, and it's quite interesting what we found. So all those changes are perceived as stronger ch changes as the pastime, so changing from not playing video games to video games. But there is no significant difference between just changing to listening to music compared to kind of dedicating your life to music. Somehow just engaging in this aesthetic activity seems to be perceived as kind of a change to your identity. Um, I have to say all those studies are unpublished, so we're kind of in the process of rethinking them and kind of trying to work with them. So any feedback is kind of um, very much appreciated on those. So but for us, that was an interesting finding. Somehow it's not the behavior, it's somehow what you value in the art that seems to kind of drive our effect. Um, one problem with music, I mentioned it before, there's a lot of social signaling going on. 
So if you like punk, you might not belong to the right group, but rather to the left group. You might not belong to the upper class in Germany. Um, if you go, there's actually a photo taken at the Wagner Festspiele in Bayreuth on the right. There are some things you can easily identify as belonging kind of to different classes. Um, we thought kind of art is not in the same way social signaling. That's the opening of the documenta. That's the, the organizer of the documenta. It's kind of more a mixed crowd if you look into the art world. So um, what we added to our questionnaire is um, we asked people, imagine you didn't care about art. Now you want to experience art all the time. We did this again with visual art. You never cared about visual art. Now you want to experience art all the time. And it's perceived as much as a change to identity as the dedicating your life to music part. We also asked people, it's kind of not an art question, more an aesthetic question, we asked them, imagine you change from not caring much about beautiful things, and now you want to occupy your life with beautiful things. Is it, does it change you as a person? And yes, it's perceived as a strong change to personal identity. It was actually the strongest we found. It's not significant compared to the others, but you see kind of uh, beauty, visual art, and music seem to be important elements of our identity. Could you, could you say something why it's called an aesthetic self? I call it an aesthetic self because it starts from you not having an aesthetic interest to having one. Okay. From not caring about music to caring about music, from not going to, to art museums to going. Before it was changing from one genre to another, from already liking music, pop music, to classical music. I liked it as an idea, kind of an anesthetic self that becomes aesthetic. Um, yeah, there, I'm not sure if I have time to go into some of the complications. Um, there are some, some things that are interesting. So kind of I, I talked about cross-cultural studies between Japan and Germany. There are actually interesting cultural differences between the US and Germany as well. And we started going more and more into those because we found kind of um, West is not West. And we seem to have kind of different cultural and aesthetic um, politics in Europe compared to the US. And one thing that's very interesting that might nonetheless have been expected is that if you change your political orientation in the US, that's the blue, I'm a bit colored now, it's blue, blue, the blue bar, it's perceived as a stronger change to identity as compared to uh, Germany. So that's some, something we expected. What was very strange is, so just some reasons for that. So politics in Germany might be less partisan. It might be maybe more private. So you don't take your, I couldn't tell by looking at somebody whether he's Republican, uh, CDU or SPD, which are the German big parties, whether it belongs to one of the either. It's not so easy to, to tell. We're gonna to come to a study in a second for the US where it seems easier to tell. Um, or the politics might, might be less moralized and more rational in Germany. But it's just some ideas we're toying with. But what is interesting, um, we didn't find the aesthetic self-effect in the US. So if their music uh, style changes, it's not perceived as kind of a change to identity. Um, so one of the future directions is look into kind of American styles. So there's some weird things going on over there. I can say that now because Jesse is not here, but there's also, we did a lot of studies on empirical aesthetics and on portraits, and that actually was the most beautiful portrait we had in our whole, whole sample in the US. So, the population was Midwest? No, it was everything from East Coast to West Coast, um, very mixed. Um, so what we start doing now, and kind of that's the last slide on that, we look into kind of maybe their differences, how they perceive those um, um, genres. So we did a kind of a, a mapping also for the US, but it looks very similar. So the only difference is that rock somehow moves more towards the middle. Everything else seems to be the same. We also started now asking people whether they think classical music is kind of a, a German art form, whether it's kind of more important. We, we do studies on cinema now. We ask Americans, do you think cinema is an American art form or a German one, whether that has an influence? We didn't find any influence on that. So we're still wondering how that came about. Um, we have to replicate some of the other things. We didn't do punk, we didn't do hip hop in the US yet. So that might be things people more identify with. We have to, but we have the general findings over several studies that somehow the aesthetic effect we look for here doesn't, uh, we didn't find it in the US. Did you focus on gender differences and age differences? We looked a bit into it. In the uh, US and Germany and nothing? <clears throat> no. Is this all out of mechanical terms or something like that? 
yeah, that's kind of that's online studies we do. Kind of that's um, so each participant only has to answer one of those questions. So it's not that we ask them with several questions because it's hard to imagine those scenarios. Kind of it's better kind of to move on to different um, questions. Yeah. Um, that's just by chance here, so can we want to do the study again. That was kind of, we had this map, we were quite happy with it, but we thought for the US it would be better, better to have a bigger sample, so it was kind of a test case for Germany, we can redo it. I, but given those data, it doesn't look it's worth going into it, it looks very similar, yeah. the map. So kind of, I rather think we should spend our money on something else than kind of going there. Um, all right. <clears throat> So one thing Jesse, but also I care about is kind of the relation of art to politics. So kind of the remainder of the talk, I'm going to focus a bit on how aesthetics might be signaling and might be used also for political means. So um, we call it the aesthetic identity meets moral and political identity. So one of the studies Jesse did over the last years is looking into how certain taste um, choices we have might signal our political values. So in the US, uh, liking jazz means you're liberal, liking country means you're conservative. Um, your fashion, hairstyle, sports, cars, TV, shows you like, um, they might convey actually what political um, um, views you hold. Um, if you, I start with an easy one, if you kind of say, if you Google artsy person, that's kind of the first thing that shows up, it's kind of this, you know, there's a lot of fashion elements that kind of show you kind of which group you might belong to. Um, that's actually, that's again Patricia Hirsch, that's an interesting artwork um, by Dennis Adams I saw in Zagreb, where he actually is called Patricia Hirsch A to Z. And by just looking at, at her hairstyle and her face, it's hard to, so kind of, which one of those actually relate to her being kind of the nice person, which one of those relates to her being the terrorist, it's hard to tell, just given the face and kind of um, facial expressions. Uh, it gets much easier if you have kind of um, information from, from um, fashion. So a study um, Jesse did with uh, Javier was on, <clears throat> they used actual photos from the United Airlines um, on-flight magazine and put them just into the, into the mechanic, Mechanical Turk, did an online study and asked people, do you think it's a liberal or it's a conservative? So how many of you would say it's a liberal? Okay, conservative? Okay, slight turn towards the liberal? Liberal, conservative, okay, more for liberal here, liberal, okay, Ed and Andreas, you're out, um, liberal, some more than before, but on what, so he wears the same thing, all that changes is the color of uh, his skin, so I, I have no idea whether they're, the right, also, yeah. Last one, no, two more. Liberal, conservative. Uh, mixed. Uh, wonder. Liberal, conservative. <laughs> yeah. okay. I, I stop now. But uh, I have no idea what the background of those people is, but somehow we seem to be confident in making those ratings. And it's kind of, uh, there seems to be some political signaling going on in those cases. So this is actually the, the whole set of images they used. And so they asked kind of, Liberal or conservative? So um, blue was conservative, liberal was kind of, uh, uh, red was uh, liberal. And just by seeing kind of um, some here, you see the first one, that might be the last one you saw, everybody thinks it's kind of a conservative. Um, it might be, it doesn't matter. The thing is, if you cut, cut the midline, you see there's a clear, clear, clear distribution. So people seem to know for those images whether it's liberal or kind of a conservative. Yeah, M moving on to art quickly for the last um, 10 minutes of the talk. So if you look into art, um, art seems to be a major source of pleasure. So kind of we invest into art, so kind of art should play, play a role for kind of um, how we identify. Um, it is also kind of a, a way to kind of go into individual expression. It also might be some elements of cultural identification we have with art, like artsy people, I mentioned that before, art uh, people. Um, also for group bonding, so kind of you might people who go to art uh, art museums, go to galleries, they might be a more conform group um, than other groups, but also art has a political meaning. So 
Um, if you go back to kind of social theories, kind of who perceives art, Bourdieu has kind of famously argued that there's a certain class kind of that kind of um, understands art better than others. So kind of art can be used to express our class standing and signal it also to others. Uh, so knowing about art gives one a certain way to kind of move up in the social society. It gives you social mobility. It helps you kind of to enter certain uh, groups you wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, and the argument from Bourdieu is kind of as a bourgeois, you have learned to make, cert make certain distinctions. You can distinguish good from bad art. You can be highly selective which art you like and kind of show that, that you're actually an, an expert in those respects. Um, and it's kind of, you have this kind of connoisseurship if it identifies you as somebody who cares about values the higher class might care about. Um, yeah? But um, if it's a, the difference between changing from a political point of view to another one, yeah. it's not perceived as such a big change of, the, of their identity. In as Germany. One, exactly. As a one in music of, of art or not art. Yeah. Then cannot be so important that art has something to do with a political point of view, but it has to do something just with being interested in something that is red or green or beautiful. I don't know. Yeah, that's actually that's a, a point of contention between me and Jesse. So he rather sees it as a strong social construction. You might signal, so by, by being interested in art, you might think kind of you might be a different person because now you moved up in your class or you're but being part of a different class. Really yeah, that, that's what it's an interesting point. So kind of maybe, so we have to rerun those studies now. After Germany, we have a new party which gained some um, fame, which is the Alternative für Deutschland. So kind of politics, because we used kind of those real world examples, politics in Germany might not be such a emotionally laden thing. Now it has changed a bit. So we did the studies before Trump and before AfD became so big. So it, yeah. Yeah. favorite color is blue and then it's red, or as I said yesterday, if my, my girlfriend is a completely natural person or is all full of yeah. um, plastic. Yeah. So actually, that's one of the future directions we're looking into. We, just, we don't just want to people, uh, ask them with those vignettes whether they perceive it as a change, but show them maybe two images. Show them kind of an abstract image and show them the, the little girl with the lamp on her arm and tell them, imagine you liked that before, now you like that, how much are you the same? Want to do the same with music? Play little snippets of music and say, "That's you change from liking that to liking that." We look. That might be kind of one way to go further. We haven't done it yet, but it's an interesting question. But just quickly going back to the politics question, I think we would find a stronger effect for politics. I think politics are highly moralized. I think kind of we use our emotions in order to come up with political uh, judgments. It was an effect of the German multi-party system. So people. Didn't, don't identify so much, maybe, with parties here. And it, kind of, it might be different now. If we re-ran it now with AfD, changing from AfD to even SPD, like a, a, a big party, um, I think we would find the same, same, same change to identity. Yeah. Um, just coming back to, to this idea of, kind of um, upper class art interest, um, I'm not sure if it's true. So kind of, I think art is not just something that kind of um, um, signals kind of social, um, uh, social higher class, but also kind of um, there are other elements kind of in our appreciation of art and where we care about art that actually um, relate to everybody. And uh, so we could, for example, think kind of um, you can express that you don't care about art by kind of having kitsch and kind of saying kind of you don't get the artwork that's kind of you don't like that, but you have this kind of kitschy um, style at your home, that's also an expression of aesthetic taste, and it's a relation you kind of might want to express kind of by kind of distancing yourself from the artwork. But there are also kind of uh, elements like street art where you can express kind of being part of kind of uh, um, an, an ostracized group kind of um, um, is, is part of your pride, and you use street art to do that. Um, that's just one example of kitsch. And we're thinking of doing studies kind of liking this, and it's kind of directly going to your own, liking this and liking kind of something we might think of a, a more interesting artwork. Um, okay, I think I'm going to jump quickly over some of the star st st stuff here just to come to one final, uh, final element that is actually very important to Jesse and also important uh, to me. That's kind of, uh, we 
in our group try to defend a certain theory for what we actually do when we appreciate art. And this theory goes back to the idea that we want to be wowed by art. We want to kind of look up to art, we want to engage strongly with art, and kind of we want to uh, be perplexed by art as well. Um, we relate that to a certain element that kind of we allow the artwork to take over for a certain mo moment. So this is an idea of kind of we allow the shrinking of ourselves by giving the artwork more space with respect to us. And um, one theory Jesse has been exploring in the last years, and we now just jointly published a paper which came out this week, we look into wonder as the emotion that might be underlying this um, um, art appreciation. And a second element that I want to focus on kind of is the idea of playfulness. So kind of in the art engagement, we are more open to new experiences, we allow new experiences, we play with our own kind of maybe also um, traits that we find important. Um, so some of the things we have been doing over the last year is kind of looking into strategies of wonder. So artists might use certain strategies to kind of instill wonder in us. And Olaf or Eliasson's work, for example, would be a good example of that, where he uses a lot of big scale elements to actually um, 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 instill wonder in us. And in wonder, we have this element, we want to look up, but we also open our mouth and eyes, we take a lot in, so kind of we, we don't have this kind of need for cognitive closure we have um, outside of the artwork. So this is kind of the three elements of wonder we find important. So we have a strong sensory engagement, we have this idea of cognitive complexity, but we also want to look up to art and, and take it and have this form of reference. Um, the last point is, in, is interesting because I think it goes in both directions. So kind of um, looking up to something and allowing it to take over uh, also has the spiritual dimension that can be exploited. So kind of um, I, I jumped quickly over art as propaganda. So you can use that in order to influence people. And a lot of of, of art is presented in, this is the König Gallery in Berlin, that's actually in a, in a former church, a brutalist church in, um, I think it's in Mitte or Kreuzberg. And you have this kind of cathedral way of kind of presenting art. So you kind of have this distance and kind of um, making art more important. But if you think of the white cube, I think the white cube, for example, is an example to where art is shown in a context-free setting, allowing you to kind of be more open to those new experiments. So there are certain strategies that allow you to kind of experience this kind of wonder that are more open. Um, this is, again, more an example of kind of art using a religious, religious context. So it's the Scrovenie Chapel in Padua. It's kind of, it's, it's very impressive. Is it? Oh, sorry. Ah, it's the wrong one. I, I like the other better. Uh, I wanted to use the Giotto Chapel. Um, so there's this, um, yeah, you, you, you're, but also you have a form of, even there you have this form of engagement, you have a complexity that kind of might kind of enable you to kind of um, engage in a certain way. Um, this is actually Jelili um, Atiku, who is an artist, so we had an event at the opening of the Venice Biennale last year on strategies of wonder, and he's a political artist, and he uses these elements of wonder, so of ritual, to actually engage you and, and kind of engage the, the audience on the street in kind of new politi political thinking. So wonder might open you for the ability to rethink your um, identities. Um, and so one of the elements, kind of, you already saw that before, so wonder might be this interesting state, emotional state between something like might wobble or extreme awe, where we're completely overwhelmed, because it has this uh, ability to be in a state of perplexity and kind of re-evaluating yourself. Um, that was just a very quick detour, just um, but to summarize what we kind of the main, main elements of the talk uh, were about. So what I tried to show is that values, be them moral, be them aesthetic values, are a central part of our identity. And we compared a bit uh, more political and aesthetic values. And I think what, 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 what we could say, and we have to show that further in, uh, in future studies, that those are all interconnected. Somehow you signal political values with aesthetics. Aesthetic might kind of um, have an influence on kind of how you perceive as yourself as a moral person. So those are studies we're going to do over the next years. Um, and the main takeaway message is also kind of we should include art and aesthetic into a study of kind of um, what and who, uh, who you are. Um, so both as an individual, but also as kind of the, the group you belong to. Um, just coming back quickly to those concerns we have in the beginning, so kind of we try to answer those, kind of not just focusing on rational choices you have, but looking into kind of embodied uh, valuings, but not just looking on, on you at, uh, at you as an individual, but as kind of how you are situated in a group, also kind of how you recognize from the outside, 
and also looking into traits you might have, aesthetic or moral traits, so kind of taking the idea of, of uh, personality more seriously, and that by including arts and aesthetics. Okay, thanks. Just quickly, so Anna is the person who helped a lot with the study on cross-cultural differences, and Javier is kind of the person who's working a lot on the moral and aesthetic self. If there are questions, I'm happy. Yeah? Okay. Ed? Before I ask my question, who's this person who took a shot at the Midwest back there? The Midwest of the United States? I said that the picture of the girl might be from the Midwest. Oh, like the population. The population. And the D, that is a D-day feats, which we'll say Europeans have about the United States, but he points to girls. The rock and roll came from the South. Bob Dylan was born in Minnesota. Okay, Country I'm music sorry. was originally a little, uh, <laughs> associated with liberal. It just shows how things can change. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that wasn't my question. Uh, could you go back to your slide way back at the beginning where you took a look at the three, I think, philosophical perspectives? Yeah. Uh, so that that is, uh, there you go. Memory. Who's the guy I got in Say again? Who is that guy? Derek Parfit. I'm happy to go that direction. So I think the first two are interesting because they have this idea of the diachronic self. So they look into kind of how you relate to your back and kind of what makes, but what also we work on is kind of how do you stay the same and when do you change? I think those are interesting with respect to that. But the problem of them is they focus very much on this diachronic aspect. Whereas uh, Christine Korsgaard, she focuses on kind of more the synchronic self. So it kind of makes yourself in the very moment how you have control now over certain states. I think, as you said, we would have to combine those in order to get a kind of a proper concept of the self. But I still would hold some of those concerns, they apply to all of them. They have a too rational view of the self. They don't take social psychology seriously, in some extent. They don't understand this idea of signaling and why it might. So they have a very essentialist version of the self also that I find problematic. Yeah. Could you say that name of the person again? That name of the, the philosopher? Uh, no, of, of the woman that uh, I think you mentioned in the context of agency. Kirsten Korsgaard. Korsgaard. K O O R S. Korsgaard. She's a Kant scholar. Okay. It works also in aesthetics. Yeah? More crowded. So um, more concentrate. It's all the things that are like added, right? And in Japan and Tokyo, the space was better. Yeah. And um, also, also what the also the texture, the texture was was um, was concerned better and more. It doesn't yeah. love the, the yeah, yeah. Stuff, but they 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 like the space. That's weird. Yeah. So we have to be so careful. Okay, but that's, that's something that comes with design. So we went into, so we did, I'm not sure where I have that. This, this I don't understand, that somebody, that, that they would perceive the third picture on the top as the picture to, to consider the best artwork. For me, it's against the, the idea of, of, um, of balance, of, I mean, I don't know if you 
want to talk about going to sleep or whatever, but a lot of rules, if you want to say, also in, in a static analysis. Okay, that, that's interesting. So that's not all the stimuli we used. So basically, we, we manipulated in all directions. So we kind of we started with an empty image and added. We started with a mid-level image and kind of added and subtracted. But we also started with a high-level image and uh, reduced the amount. And we showed it to art historians before we did the study. So uh, sometimes they laughed. So we did, I remember we had a Goya where we changed the pattern on the little boy. And they laughed. So we, and they did, but we asked them whether they actually uh, see problems in our images. For example, with the lily we showed with the golden background, we had there a pattern going through the image, and the, the, the Japanese art historians told us you never mix nature with culture in those images. So we took that out. So we had, and in the sample we used it. It was kind of it was uh, psychology students in Tokyo and in Berlin. They didn't prefer the original over our manipulations. We were really lucky. We didn't. We expected also kind of we did. So we were quite proud with our images, but we didn't expect to have no effect. But it's completely a chance whether they take the original or our manipulations. That's also, that's, I think, one of the interesting things about empirical statics, that you have to allow for those things where you wouldn't expect them to kind of um, Sorry, um, to be open. They pick the original? We didn't ask them. So we, we avoided that. But they didn't prefer it. They didn't prefer the original. And they didn't rec recommend it more to be exhibited at an art museum than the others. No. no. So that's what I wanted to show. You see the yellow glow? So sometimes the original was kind of low, sometimes it was in the middle, sometimes it was that. But kind of we, saw, we had um, a full set of images starting from each, each position. So it wasn't just that we added more things and changed the balance. No. We tried to, and we tried to be as art historically plausible as possible. That's why I showed you the perugino. Where actually, 10 years before, it would have been an impossible image, what he did. It still was at the time he did it, but then he changed kind of the way painting worked. But kind of both things are possible. So we tried to be, sometimes we were better, sometimes less good, but kind of in general, we did a good job. So they didn't pick our, the original over our manipulations. Okay, thanks.